So I hope everyone's doing well. I'm Marcy. I'm the director of support for Shopify. I've been with Shopify for almost five years and entirely with support the entire time. So for a little bit of context, we had less than 10 people working in support when I joined. And some of you are kind of familiar with our size now. And Mikkel's joining us from Zendesk, a partner that we've worked with in support for almost four years now. Um, no? <laughs> You're shaking your head like, no, no. OK. Um, and today we're going to talk a bit about um, Zendesk and how they've grown their support and the impacts of actually starting your business and, and growing it. Um, we really want to get it. Yeah. OK. Tell us a little bit about when you started Zendesk. <laughs> yeah. We'll okay. wait for some folks to come Thank in. Thank you. Too. Yeah, so, uh, so first and foremost, like Zendesk is uh, based here in San Francisco. We have our headquarters here in San Francisco. And I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to this high-tech city. <laughs> Um, <laughs> this happens every week, uh, but it brings us closer together. Uh, no, but it's uh, it's it's uh, it's really cool to be here. And like, so uh, I have an accent because I am originally from Denmark. I've been living here in San Francisco for eight years. And is there any like, how many here from Europe? How many here do we have from Europe? Well, that's a good. It's a good chunk. And how many like? So uh, that's one of the things we've been talking a little bit about. Like, what is the what is the, the Shopify partner ecosystem actually like? How many of you think about yourself as a startup? Well, it's, a, it's a good chunk too. All right, but that's interesting because like, I think some of the story that is interesting to talk about is just like a startup story. Uh, and, and, and of course, we are a company in customer service. Um, so we have a lot. We have a lot to uh, we have a lot to say about customer service too. Marcy is running customer service too. But um, so, Sendesk is a company. We we went public right about the same time. I as think just like weeks or maybe a few months before us, kind of. Yeah. Think. Okay. Yeah. So it's very very close by, um, and we have a little bit. We have we have honestly we have a lot of Shopify envy. Um, I, how many here are Shopify investors? How many here own stock in Shopify? OK, you should all own stock in <laughs> Shopify. Uh, like the, 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 the market cap went up like by $400 million just yesterday. Uh, so go out and buy some stock. But we have a lot of uh, Shopify envy because it's a great stock and a great company. Um, but we started Sendesk out of Copenhagen uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, bootstrapped it there. Uh, but then, uh, a little bit like Shopify was started out of, was it originally out of Europe or was, were they, were Toby and were they in Ottawa by then? I believe Toby and Daniel were in Ottawa when they okay. got started. Yeah. Right. But like, Copenhagen is kind of the Ottawa of Europe. Um, <laughs> Um, but we said, no, we cannot build a company here, and then decided to move it to San Francisco instead, where we raised $100 million uh, and took the company public uh, five years after. Um, so a little, followed a little bit of the same path as Shopify, um, and coming out of the same generation of kind of a new generation of enterprise or software companies in general, uh, we share a lot of the same philosophies and and approaches as, as Shopify. We believe tremendously in the openness of the platform. We believe tremendously in your ability to develop to the platform. We believe tremendously in democratizing access to great software. Um, so uh, we have a lot of shared values with Shopify, and therefore, I'm also very excited to be here and, and to meet you all. I think one of the really unique opportunities that we have to talk with you about today is the fact that when you start a company, and no matter, you know, you're, you're a much bigger company now than you were when you started, obviously, um, but there was a, t a, a time in your life when, when you were the one that were answering the support emails, the sales emails, and everything that anybody had coming through. I know Toby went through it as well. Um, and and I'm, I'm wondering, because there's a few people in the audience that are going to be in a very similar situation right now, or possibly even have one or maybe two support people working for them, and that changes, that changes your position as a CEO in a company, and, and they t tell us a little bit about that and how it changed for you. No, but that, that's true, of course, that like, when you are a small company, that's yeah. only you to do customer service and to do support. And um, I was... I was terrible. <laughs> I find that I was so hard to believe. At customer support and customer service, like you, that empathy, kind of that you have to your customer situation. Like I was just way too busy to 
<laughs> like if you if you got in touch with me, I'll always be like, ah, oh, come on, really figure is, it out. That is so different than what oh. you told me on Wednesday, Nickel. <laughs> yeah. So different. But it's so true. Uh, he was telling me on Wednesday that he gives his customers everything that they want. <laughs> but it is so true. Like, and I think that's. I think I'm not the only one who who feel like that. I feel I'm. I, I feel that, and I, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of you people can cannot understand where I'm from or that that like you're super busy you're trying to grow your company and then you have all these goddamn customers interrupting you all the time <laughs> you know with their stupid questions no, and then okay. they, no, and, no. and then they try then they try to kind of you know get a bigger deal better better deal and try to you know game the system and just like ah oh. <laughs> But the truth is, of course, that we all know what great customer service is. We all know that great customer service, like whenever, if we reach out to, some, to a company, to an organization to get help, the worst thing that can happen is when the person we get in touch with starts to argue with us. That's just the worst thing. Like we're like, really? I, I, I put through, I've gone through all this effort. I cared so much about your company and your product and your pricing and shit, and now I'm reaching out to you with a real problem, and then you start arguing with me. You're like, oh, you're using the product wrong. That, don't, don't tell me that. Like, this, like, go to a website, find it, figure it out yourself. You know, you don't, you don't want those answers. You don't want to start an argument with somebody in customer service. But for a lot of us, that's, that's how we, that's, we feel it as, as product owners, as company owners, we feel attacked when somebody comes to us and say like, I can't figure out your stuff. We feel like we, we, feel like we need to protect it. So that's a very real thing, I think, as a business owner or as starting a small business, you have to think about like that, that building that empathy and under, truly understanding the, the, the situation is really, really hard. Because what we want to do, what we want to have as consumers, as, as, as what we want as people is that when we gone through the effort of actually reaching out to the company. We just want them to empathize with us and give us what we want. Fix our problem and give us what we need. Give it to yeah. us. And actually, from, a, from the perspective of a business, it's so easy just to give the customer what they want. Oh, you, oh, you, you want access to this? Sure. Oh, you want this price discount? Sure. Just give it to them. Because what do you actually lose from just Whatever, if, whatever the, if the customer is right or not, what do you actually lose from just giving them what they need? So you did, lose absolutely nothing. Did it change for you then? Because you were doing this. You were doing this, you know, when you first started, you were talking to your customers. You were giving them exactly what they wanted. And then Zendesk started to grow, and you didn't get the chance to do this as often. Did, well, it, did it change? Yeah, I think it, definitely, I think it definitely helped when we started kind of getting people into the organization whose job it was to, to think about that. And I think I personally, I think I personally learned tremendously from these people. You know, that here's, here's some people you hire into the organization whose primary job is just to support the customer experience, help the customer. And what we did in Sendus, for example, what we, we, we named them, or we gave them the title of customer advocates. And the whole idea was that they were advocates for, our, for, for, the, for the customer and not for the business. They were, their job was to put themselves in the shoes of our customers. And I think that helped us with a lot of things. And I think even today, if you look at some of the most successful companies, I, we, we talked about this the other day, we talked, about, um, we talked about Amazon as a great example of that actually. Like Amazon is actually a, a company where it's pretty hard to get customer service. And their philosophy is very much to kind of let the machines, let the computer deal with issues. Let the computers deal with fraud. Let the computers deal with all the things that can sometimes fall through the crack in a traditional uh, process. So let the, let, the, let the machine, let the computers to the widest possible extent take care of the customer service. And it's only if it falls outside of what the machine can handle, then it becomes very easy to get in touch with customer service. I've only tried that a few times where something happened to an order, and then it's right there. Reach out to this person, this person will help you. You click the button, you're in touch with that person in like 
five seconds, they know exactly what the case is, and they will help you within like 30 seconds. And it's an amazing experience. It's a wonderful experience, and it's a really great example of, of how customer support and businesses, no matter what size you are, are able to actually leverage some of the opportunities from machine learning or self-help and different communities that way um, that maybe weren't necessarily cultivated or, or maximized when, when we're talking about what your experience would have been going through that transition of, of growing. But everybody here is, is doing essentially what you did. They're doing that now. Um, and they have many different opportunities in front of them uh, to be able to support their customers, our same merchants. Um, so I want to talk, I guess, a little bit about, oh, you have something that you want to talk about? No, no, no. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I want to talk a bit about how, um, you know, how, how some businesses are actually able to make decisions for their support team now. So uh, let's, let's see, like, let's talk a bit about the Zendesk strategy around how you decide to support your customers and how you might have done that at a different scale when you were smaller and what are the choices that are out there for people growing their business now? Um, well, I think that, I think, I think it's very interesting because like all of you guys, you know how to do that stuff because you're working with, on, with, with when I have a great commerce experience online, I know it's powered by Shopify because it's so smooth. Like I wanna, I have money, I wanna spend them. Here's a shop, they know how to take my money really easily. Like that, that, that experience and that well, the whole experience is just so smooth and like for me to give the business my money is just like a, 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 all the hurdles in that experience uh, has been taken away. Like for example, like Shopify really early figured out how to integrate Apple Pay with uh, all the, all the uh, shops. It's just amazing. Like because like you sit at home in the evening, you need to buy some new, uh, you know, sheets, whatever, for your kids' beds, whatever. And like you have three glasses of wine. Uh, no, but like if you run into friction, you're just like, ah, blah, 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 I'm going to do that tomorrow. <laughs> but like if it's so easy and it's just like you, you basically shop with your thumbprint and it's just like, oh, this is so easy. That's the, that's the optimal situation, like making things easy. And the same goes for customer service. Once you start being into this, oh, I have to contact somebody. You know, once you get into that, that's, why you, that's the first friction. And then if it gets difficult to contact somebody, like if I sit in the evening and I can't reach them until the following business day, I'm just like, ah, forget about it. So you have to make these things as easy as possible. Customer service, if it's not frictionless, and if you don't give the customer exactly what they want when they've taken the effort of reaching out to you, forget about it. Then it's just like, then it's, of course there's differences when we talk technical support and so on, where it becomes really complicated and then, and so on. But like the philosophy around customer service should be make it as easy as possible and give the customers exactly what they want. What they ask for, just give it to them. I think that's a, That was that's not something. what you asked for well, at all. Well, it's, it's close. It's close. So <clears throat> I guess that's something that we both have in common, right? But Shopify and Zendesk, we have that in common. So we, have, we build products, and they're, they're about making things easy and accessible for the audience. And considering, considering your strategy and support is a direct extension of somebody's interaction with your brand and your product um, is, is a really important experience for everybody that's going to be buying. Because it, it can be one of those things that continues your buying opportunity or actually stops it and negates your future customers from coming back. Um, yeah, but there's no doubt, like, when we talk about loyalty, when we talk a lot about loyalty between a business and its customers, it's, it's not about providing this amazing experience. It's not about, oh, I really, really need to wow the person. I really need to go yeah. above and beyond. It has to nothing to do with that. It's just about removing friction. That's, 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 the, that's, that's the primary, and all the research shows that, is that the primary reason for re, uh, retaining a customer is that you just remove the friction in all the interactions you have between yeah. uh, them and you. Um, and it sounds so easy, but it's really complicated because so when, we, when we run our businesses, we tend to think that all the things we do are so important, <laughs> which they're not. You know, the most of the stuff we're doing in a business is super unimportant because we have a very hard time really understanding how things look like from the perspective of the customer. Um, and if we, if we can take, if we can put ourselves in the seat of the customer and think about how does these things look for them and how do we move as much friction in that relationship, we really have an opportunity to change that relationship. 
Yesterday I had the chance to talk with a bunch of our partners and they were asking a lot of questions around what do I do next? So I'm currently offering emails or I'm currently using some CRM. Do I introduce chat? Do I introduce phone? I'm testing, you know, doing some social support on Facebook Messenger or Twitter, but what do I actually do? Um, so tell us a little bit about, like, you know, with Zendesk, like you're, you're doing more than just being a ticketing system, more than just emails. You're, you're giving businesses the opportunity to have that omni-channel or multi-channel experience for their customers. But how do they actually make those decisions based on their business? Well, I think, so first and foremost, it depends tremendously on the business, and it depends tremendously on your products. Uh, it depends tremendously on your customers, and it depends tremendously where these customers are. But, like, I think we're in, like, when I was young, uh, right after Second World War, I, uh, <laughs> no, there was, <laughs> there was, like, there was one way of getting in touch with my bank, for example. I could call them between uh, 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., uh, Monday to, through Wednesday and then Friday. Thursday was a different thing. And that was how, if I wanted to get in touch with them, that was how it was done. I had one number and then they could guide me through to somebody who could maybe help me. That was the only way I could get in touch with that bank. Today, like we can't, like we, we are not in the liberty of telling our customers this is how you're supposed to get in touch with us. You need to figure out where are your customers talking? You know, are, are they, like, is, is half of their interactions, is that in the comment tracks to a YouTube video? Because then you better, you need to embrace that. If you have apps, you know, and they are on Google Play, on, on, on uh, Apple Store, like, maybe a lot of these interactions about your app is actually happening right there in the comment track, and then you need to embrace those channels. So you need to be agnostic to the channels. You can't just say, this is how I want to communicate. You need to figure out what makes most sense for the customer. And there are different contracts around, like, engagement contracts around different channels. Like, if we send an email, we have some kind of idea about when we want to get an answer back. You know, if it takes more than a day, something is off with an email. Like, if, if, if we write an email and people are not back to us within that same day or something, like, we've broken the email contract. In our world, if we're supporting our merchants and they're waiting 24 hours to actually hear back from a problem, that's, that could be 24 hours that they're not making money, yeah. that they're not making sales, that their storefront is down, that all these things. So response time and the relationship between how we actually extend that support and fix those issues is a massive implication yeah. for a successful merchant system. And you, you know, that's why a lot of us are avoiding uh, phone support. Because like the traditional experience a lot of us have with phone support is that we have to go through all these IVRs, then we, uh, then we have to hold for like 10 minutes, then we talk to somebody, then they put us for hold for five minutes, and then we talk to somebody else. And through, like, if you have your kind of how aggravated and annoyed am I right now chart through that conversation, it just goes like this. You know? Like you're getting more and more agitated and you just sit there and like you, you, you got tethered to your phone because you can't just let it go. Incredibly frustrating experience. That's, so that's a different contract for a phone call. Like if you want to have a good, con if you have a good phone conversation, you have to pick it up when somebody calls, and you have to deal with it right there. If not, you're breaking the, the phone uh, contract, the phone conversation contract. And all these channels have the same different contracts. If you want to do customer service over Facebook Messenger, for example, like you can't, you can't say like our opening hours are from this to this. You have to be on that channel all the time. And if somebody reaches out to you, you have to, be back, you have to get back to them immediately. Because on Facebook Messenger or all these other Messenger channels, we are not used to waiting. Like, we expect somebody, if we, if we reach out, we expect them to come back to us immediately. So, if these channels make sense for your audience, you need to, you need to live up to the contract there are for these channels. Um, and you're really talking about the implied contract around, like, the expectations of your, of your buyers. Not yourself. Like, your own contracts, nobody cares about your SLAs. Nobody. No, they don't. What matters for them is kind of what is the customer expectation when you go into a conversation. And think about it in your personal relationship too. If one of your friends sends you an email and you don't reply back until the next day, they're like, that shit, he doesn't, he, like, he's, what, what the hell? Like, What's he more doesn't care about this. What is more important than me? I thought we were friends. You know? If, you're, if your wife or your husband texts you, you better text back right away. 
That's how it is. That's just how it is. If, if, they, if you don't get an answer to your textbook like, until two hours, We've all been there, you know. <laughs> did, did, that's all you want to tell us about that? That's your, <laughs> it's your answer? Okay. Um, so, so how, like, how, do, how, do, how does everybody here begin to understand their audience? Like, if, unless they go out and they actually install a chat app or they start to, t start to put out a phone number and pick up their phone calls or engage and put out messages to actually elicit support over Facebook or Twitter. How well, do we know this? I, I think is that the idea is that if you want to do something and if you have an idea about this, what it has, it works well. You go full in on it. Like if you if you have chat and you say like I'm actually uncertain about how people are doing right here in the shopping experience, and like if I put it in a chat so they could reach out to me instantly, I may have an idea about I could figure that out. So if you put in that chat window, that chat request right there in the experience, be all over it. You know, be, make sure that if people use it, you're right there for them and they can help you and you can help them right away. Don't make it, don't try to be, well, you know, it may take 10 minutes for them to get in touch with somebody or if I'm not here, they can leave a message. That's not good enough. Like if you wanna, if you wanna try these channels, go all in on them. Um, but then like maybe constrain it, maybe only offer that three hours during the day until you realize what's actually going on and how useful is it? Like how, how much does this actually impact my conversion rate? By staffing chat here, can I take up my conversion rate with 10%? Because maybe that's, then it's a really, really good, bit, good business. I like that you're talking about conversion rates and the impact that they, like, the support actually has on them. So I'm, I'm not sure how many people actually use the opportunity of support, you know, somebody's actually reaching out to you for help to further engage that merchant with your brand even more. Understand their business, understand what they're trying to achieve by using your product, and then being able to take that interaction one step further so they come to you with the problem, they leave with the solution, and feeling more loyal to your, your app. Um, Zendesk, I think, does a really great a really great job of actually engaging with their, their brands and clients and understanding what the needs of those businesses are. Um, why, don't, why don't we talk a little bit about how you actually take that customer feedback and how it influences the rest of your product and where you take it. Well, let me, so I think our guiding principle, and this is, a, this is something that is really hard, especially as you scale and grow the company. Like we are, we are an organization around 1,700 people and Oh, like we have like a hundred thousand people paying customers on a platform, another like hundred thousand on a free platform, and it's just like, you know, scaling all of these things gets complicated. But I think so. That's why it's important to find like what is the principle for what drives you here, and if we think about ourselves and how we deal with companies, like if if the kind of if the experience from being sold to, or the experience from being marketed to to being sold to to being supported. If these things, if these experiences get very different, you know, if you have one great experience when you're being sold to, but the moment you need support, they're just telling you to F off, that's like, you don't like, you lose all the trust you have in that company. And like from a customer perspective, you don't, you don't want to know what, what department are dealing with me now. Well, I have to transfer you or like, this is, this is our finance operations that deals with, you know, questions to your bill. Like we do that, it's just terrible, I'm sorry if any of you have ever had that interaction. But like, that's just the reality of it. When we build our processes as an organization, we think in functional teams. You know, sales is over here, service here, support, and then we have success, and we have services, and we have, you know, finance operations and sales operations. And this is how you're being, like when you as a customer hand to interact with us, you have to navigate all of these different things and you have a completely different experience every time. So our guiding principle is that we try as much as possible to say like, from the perspective of the customer, it doesn't matter what part of the organization you just interacted with. Like whether you are being sold to or marketed to or, or supported, like you don't wanna know as a customer. For you, as much as possible, it has to be one seamless conversation. So to do that, you have to have fantastic handoffs. You need to have systems that can always contextualize the conversation with you. Um, and you have to build a culture in the organization that are not thinking in these silos. And it's incredibly hard. Also because when you go out and buy software, you buy, you, you buy different types of software for different departments. Like, oh, they have marketing automation software over here. And here they have e-commerce software. And here they have, you know, support software. And here they have sales software like that. And then that's how, you, that's how we think about buying software. 
Um, but like for us, our challenge and what we try to do is when we build software, we try to build software that starts with the customer. And they say, okay, how do we actually support the whole customer experience through that software? I, I didn't answer your question. I know that, but. So, so. That's okay, because what we're going to do, and the app, um, unfortunately, isn't working, so what we'll do is we'll take some live questions from the audience, and we have about 10 minutes to, to do some questions, so let's start with one or two. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Here. An observation as you explain this, what I, I call this? Shopify support, no matter, oh, okay. I think a good example of excellent support is Shopify support. I may be calling about an accounting issue, I may be calling about a pop-up issue, and and they usually have the answer right there. And if they don't have the answer, they say, hold on, I'm going to text another part of the team. And, and I, I, I really like that. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I wish Shopify would turn off music on hold. Um. It's our own personal band. What? It's my own personal band. That's your own personal band? <laughs> well, at least let me turn it off. <laughs> but anyway, but, uh, but that's a good example. No, but I think Shopify is a great example of that. The responsibility of navigating the organization is not the customers. The responsibility of that is Shopify, is the support team, is the customer service team. It's their responsibility to help the customer navigate that and not give them, not alienate them in that process. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a very good point and I think Shopify is doing a great job of that. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> it's, it's, we do practice. Like, we try and keep everybody as much, as much information and the people that actually answer your, your ticket right off the bat within that. I mean, as you guys have grown with Shopify, many of you have been with us for quite a few years. It's, it's, there's been a lot more that's been added to the platform. So to try and keep that balance where people know the answer but also have the chance to, to get somebody that can dig in a little bit more is, is great. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think I saw a question right over here. Oh, there's two. Microphones there. The Oh, thanks. Hi. So I was wondering if I could get some more information on how to build a seamless conversation when internally we are segmented and we may not have enough people to specialize in everything. You know, we have to secure ourselves in what we know. So how do we have a seamless conversation with our customer in that kind of a context? Or do you have any tips? Yeah. A, a lot about it is, is really about ensuring that you have the context of the customer, that you know whether they're tweeting with you or they're emailing or you have them on the phone, that you, that you as much as possible try to build that profile so you have all the context about the customer and you can also see what are all the previous interactions, how they've been using our website, how have they been using you know, our partner network, all these different things, so you have that context. Like you, you, the more context you can give and, and making that context really easy and digestible uh, is, is so important. Like a basic thing, you know, how long has it been a customer? You know, if somebody calls you and they've been a customer for five years, they've been buying your products for five years, you know, you, that, that sets like they've probably been a customer of yours for longer than you worked in the company. You know? They, they, you, you need to have that context when you actually like, because there's nothing worse than a long loyal customer, you know, like suddenly giving them promotions like their new customer or something like that. It's, it's the worst. So this is one of the things like context, context and access to all the information is so incredibly important. I was just going to it sounds like you're saying that some of the questions that come in, the people that actually have the answers are not the ones that are going to be giving the answers and then how do you get access to those people to get back to their customer really quickly? Um, I think that any com company that's going through any sort of growing pains, it's going to be fairly similar. But but the centricity around everybody sort of uniting towards, okay, we need to solve their problem. Like this is our customer, um, is is super important. So starting, like Michael said, with the culture around it, is a great place to start. And then whatever works for your organization, you're going to have some organizations that keep their information in like Google Google Docs, or you're going to create an, an internal wiki, or you're going to have a chat tool like Slack to be able to share information over channels. But whatever it is, is that you have your your team and your company that's really focused on the outcomes of of getting that back to that that customer, and knowing that whatever they're experiencing is holding up holding up their success. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. And we're going to pop over here for one question, and then I think somebody over here had one after. So there and then there. Yeah, it was a build up on what that lady was just asking over there. And the question um, that I have was for I, I completely buy in with everything what you're saying in terms of providing the customer experience where they need it, when they need it, and so on. With a smaller startup organization that may have 10, 20, or maybe 30 people on their support team, maybe aren't 24-7, um, 
what would you recommend to companies that have those limited resources, limited human power, in order to address those, that level of uh, that ideal customer experience? Well, I think you, <laughs> if, I think if 24 seven, if you have a shop that is 24 seven, but you're not able to help your customers 24 seven, like you just, then you, and then you just have to embrace that when I have three glasses of wine, I want to buy your stuff, like, you're not giving me, you're, you're not giving me the experience I need and, and you may lose me as a customer. And so like you have to make that calculation. Is okay. that, is that so, worth the while? So if you're, if you're picking that as your sales model, a 24 seven sales model, which is what all software sold online or any products store, whatever you call it, is sold online, then you're saying you have to commit. To Some people can't afford it though. When you're starting a business, it's, it's expensive to actually employ people to do this job 24 seven, right? Yeah, but you just, yeah. it's, it's a trade off, you know? Do you need those, do, do, can, you, can you live with a drop off in conversion rates in the evenings because you may have a harder time getting in touch with you? Can you live with that? And maybe you can live with that for a while and maybe at some point you figure out your volume is big enough that it, now it suddenly it makes, it makes sense. Um, but it's a little bit like, it's a little bit like, you know, if you have a physical shop, if you want to have that shop open 24 seven, it, don't you have, don't you want somebody in there in the evening too? That, it, it's kind of, you know, I think that's, you have to think about that. You can't just be 24 seven in one part of your organization. We have one, one question over here. Yeah, go for it. So, so I understand most of the conversation is about the support you provide to the shops, our clients. But I was wondering if you have plans to deliver the, le the same level of excellence to the partners, like the app developers and other partners, because that is not as good as we deal with the clients, obviously. Uh, and it's sometimes not really easy. So is there any plans to uh, uh, have more transparency where the case is, what is happening to our questions or things like that? Yeah, so I think it sounds like you're asking, is there going to be a clear path to follow your, your ticket, essentially, that comes into support, and what's happening to it? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the support you provide to your partners, not the one yeah. that you're providing to the shops, because those are completely different. So the partners, like for API support type of thing? Yeah, like that. Yeah. I think that it's, it's something that's been um, not... Just say yes, Marcy. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Give him what he wants. Come on. <laughs> Who invited you? <laughs> I was going to say yes in a roundabout way, but I guess we're short on time. Thank it's you. always a plan to, like, if we weren't trying to improve everything that everybody was experiencing with Shopify, like, where would we actually be? So I know, I know that it's something that needs a lot of work. And yeah, it's definitely something we're working on. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks for that, Michael. That was a big help. <laughs> Yeah, we have, we have uh, one more. Great. Hi. Um, I have a question about uh, support from Shopify. Sometimes uh, we have an app on Shopify. It's called Looks. Can yeah. you hear me? You can't hear me? That's better. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, we have an, a, a Shopify app called Looks. And sometimes we get uh, support calls uh, from people who contact Shopify. And then this is something of an integration process between Shopify and the app and the theme. And then it starts like a cycle with all three uh, parties. So how do we deal then with that? Because uh, the Shopify representative doesn't really uh, know how this works and how the integration works. So I, I don't know if everybody heard your question, but basically it was um, that sometimes a merchant is actually encountering an issue with their shop because they have a theme that's downloaded or they have an app that's down they could have multiple apps that are downloaded and something that's actually conflicting is causing a problem and who figures out that problem how do we know where it needs to be solved um, and it definitely does start within the frontline support team at shopify so with the guru team to begin and sort of assess that and try and figure out where it is and then sometimes we need to bring in other teams to actually figure it out like just how you're saying it's a complicated problem because there's many different pieces involved sometimes we will have to engage with a partner or a developer to actually figure out where it is. And when we actually figure out where it is, then we'll look to the person that's the right person to actually fix the problem as quickly as possible. And like I'm, I'm hearing like the undertone of that it's not perfect and there's a lot of room to fix that. Yeah. It starts a blame game between the, it mostly goes to the app. Mostly goes to the app, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Sometimes it is. <laughs> 
Woo! And on that high note, uh, <laughs> Are we out of time? We are out of time, but thanks, Michael, for doing this. I know that this was not the setting that everybody was expecting, but it was really nice to see everybody, and thank you for coming, and thanks for asking your questions. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.